Hello. <laughs> I'm super happy to be here. Hello. I see so many here already on. Welcome to today's workshop. I'm so excited to be here with you. And I see many people from all over the world. I'm just reading here in the different comments that we have. From the UK, we have people here. Evidence here. Hi. Um, wow, so many people. Emma, hi. So nice to see you. Jacqueline, you're here, here as well. Dear. Nice. From Scotland, we have people. Wonderful. I always love that about doing things on the internet. We get to meet people from all over the world. I myself, I'm in Germany, Munich. And I'm very, very excited to be here with you. I know. Oh, let me see if I can get the uh, focus right. <laughs> okay. Um, so we are here because we want to learn about selling students on Amazon. And I am super ready for that. Before we get started, I want to ask out of curiosity, because I know I have a lot of new faces here that I've never seen before. Have you ever sold journals and planners before? Yes or no? And it doesn't matter if you have done it before or not. There's enough to learn here, I promise you. But I would like to know out of curiosity. It can be digital as well. So if you've done digital sales for journalists and planners, you can always put that in there as well. So we see no, only digital. Quite a few no's. We have some yeses in between, only digital. No, but I'm ready. I love that. Not for me, but for my clients. Nice. Are you a designer? Maybe we have some designers in between here too. Awesome. I love that. Cool. So many people. So let me give you a few expectations of what's going to happen today. And I'm going to give you some expectations of what's not going to happen today. I know I have a lot of people that are my clients here and people that tend to come to my workshops because you all know that this does not tend to be fluff and it's not a pitch fest. I want to, however, have that said before. Yes, I do have an offer. And if you want to be working with me, take this further, there's a possibility. But I want you still to be able to relax and enjoy the workshop without wondering, okay, when is she going to just pitch? <laughs> because yes, there's going to be an offer, we're going to make the best out of it from the get-go and learn as much as we can. And today is a workshop that is a lot different to what I usually do because we're going to look a little bit more into transformational journals and journals for coaches. You don't have to be a coach, but if you're into personal development, this might be interesting to you. Or if you're looking into an interesting business opportunity, that's also going to be interesting to you. We do have a workshop. A uh, workshop workbook that comes with the workshop, you're going to get all the copies of all the PDFs tomorrow. I want you to focus today on the uh, uh, workshop. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Word. And I don't want you to be looking at um, any um, PDFs while we're doing this. Also, if you've been in any of my workshops, I don't tend to do presentations because I stuck at presenta <laughs> presenting with slides. I get very awkward. I present with post-its and with a whiteboard. So that's what we're going to do. And um, we're going to be playing a bit um, with that. I try to make it as interesting as possible. It's not always easy because, you know, some of the parts can be sometimes a little bit boring if we have to talk about data, but, you know, it is important to talk about all the components that are going to help you be successful. I want to give you just a bit of my backstory before we get started, especially for all of you that have never been around. I have been an Amazon seller, so I started this as an Amazon seller. I failed at it miserably. <laughs> that was a few years ago, already quite a few, almost 10 years ago. And I kind of became obsessed because I knew it has to work. Like so many people are buying things on Amazon. So many people are selling things on Amazon. Like there must be a way to make this work. I ended up working for Amazon. I thought, okay, let's just learn from the source itself. And I used to take care of Amazon sellers day. So for quite a few years, I didn't have a business yet. 
anymore because the one that I had failed and I learned why it failed and I will tell you later why my business failed because now it's so clear to me but at that time I didn't know how better um, and I learned my craft by working for Amazon and working with a lot of different sellers and I've been consulting for roughly eight years around Amazon selling and then a few years ago 2020 I finally have been able to combine my true passion, which is journals. I've always loved journals ever since I was a little girl. You know, I know many of you who are, you know, journal junkies just like me. You can let me know in the comments if you are. But I tend to attract other journal junkies. <laughs> and I always wanted to create a journal, but I never felt like I could do it because I am German. My native language is not English. And I'm dyslexic, so I'm not great with writing and grammar, and I'm <laughs> not a good designer. So I felt like everything is against me for ever, for ever being able to do this. But 2020, I came across print on demand first, and then I transformed it into physical products. In a matter of three years, it became a seven-figure business, um, and. It's been quite a while, right? And I've been also able to help others. So I've worked one-on-one, -on -one, done for you, and in group coaching with a lot of different people who have created stationary products. And I'm very proud of all the results that we have gotten. We have gotten incredible results. And I'm not giving myself all the credit for that. I'm giving the timing of doing this right now the credit because on Amazon, there is a massive opportunity at this point of time. There's more demand than there's good supply. And I'm going to um, share as much of my experience with you today so that we can all ride that wave that is on Amazon right now, which is an enormous wave. And when I'm talking about <clears throat> I created a seven-figure business with stationery, I basically went from zero dollars with stationary business, uh, stationary products, to having sales of $200,000 just with one brand in one month. This is how crazy it went. And it's not by accident. It's not because I have hundreds of products. In fact, that happened with 11 products with a few color variations. That's all that I did. And I'm going to share with you how I did that. And the important components that made this possible. <clears throat> so I see. Uh, yeah, hope oh, that this is clear now. Okay, so this has been my mission. My mission was I wanted to create a really successful business for a long time. Just didn't figure out how until I did. And in order for me to figure this out, there were five essential components. And before we dive into creating a journal and doing all of that stuff, I want to share those components because that really is going to make it or break it. Because if you, I mean, one component is just an add-on, but the other four, without, it's not as easy to do. Now I've put the three that we have down here up there because I've learned from other <laughs> workshops that I did and once I start moving this around, it all falls down. And then I feel a little bit nervous, like, oh my God, it's all falling down. <laughs> so we are going to start with these three components first. And the reason we need to start with these components, because we cannot just dive into a product idea right away without knowing what is actually going to make it successful. Because if we cannot make it successful, no, not it's not worth spending the time or the money. Um, because I've seen actually in the school group already that someone has already tried Amazon and it didn't work, they only lost money. And I really, I really hate to see these um, type of things because I'm sure that with the right components that we're going to be talking about here, not getting sales is very highly unlikely. I'm not saying you're going to have a million dollar business. That's not what I'm going to say, but not getting sales, very highly unlikely. And let's talk about these things. 
Uh, my eyes just zoom the piles of stack books. Yeah, these are stack books. And then behind me, do you see these books here? These are all my own products, my journals, actually. Um, and this is a little bit off topic, but I want to quickly show you. And this is my newest launch. Launched, I think, 10 or 11 days now ago. 10 days ago, it launched. So uh, in the school community, you can see um, the behind the scenes. I, I share a little bit in the school community as well, a little bit of an update. Anyway, back to the workshop. We talked about the three main components to have a happy situation on Amazon. And we are going to start with the biggest one. You see that they're not all equal in size because they're not all equal in importance. <clears throat> so we have here the very, very first one, which is market research. And market research sounds like such a boring word, honestly, but it's really important because if you want to sell something that no one is searching for, well, how is someone going to buy it? And this is such a tricky balance to find, especially when we are new to business, because somehow in society, the idea is um, if I want to start a business, I have to have something so unique, almost as if we have to invent something totally new in order to sell it. And I'm not saying that that cannot work. Yeah, that can work. But for if you want to invent something, then you need a budget that is massive. Inventions are often possible for companies that already have the resources for it because inventions do take a lot of resources. That's maybe not really what we want to do. We want to create a business and sell products that we know are going to sell. And that's why it is sometimes counterintuitive that we don't want to invent something totally new, but we want to look at what are people actually looking for and what are people buying? Is there proof of concept? Now, selling on Amazon makes it very easy to do this. And we are lucky to live in these times now where we have softwares that tell us how many people are searching for things. We can look at Google Trends. There's so many possibilities. When I was 19, I lived in Australia and I was a backpacker. And they had like these all these odd jobs that were, they were paying us like $10 an hour or so. And one job was at a bakery to stand there and with a clicker, count how many customers come every day. <laughs> and the reason why was because that new competitor wanted to do some market research and wanted to calculate roughly if opening a new bakery in that area was going to make sense. Now, we are lucky we don't need to be standing in the Barnes and Nobles and, you know, start <laughs> counting how many people are buying journals in order to know, hey, is this going to be worth it? Because we have the possibility of knowing exactly what the numbers are like. And especially on Amazon, because if we look at what it is, what is it? I mean, it's a search engine similar to YouTube, similar to Google. So similar to any other search engine. A search engine is basically a place where people look for something. If we open our phone and open our Amazon app, we look for what we want to buy. We tend to not just scroll around and find it. There's not a lot of possibilities like that on Amazon. So that means we have to offer something that people are actively searching for. And that also means there is data, there is information of what people are searching for. Now, if we know what people are searching for, and that's like the main food thing we need, is demand. Now, I have a bit of a gift for you. Um, let me quickly share my screen and show you, because I have a mini membership where we do these researches on Amazon every single month. Let me show you what this could roughly look like. Um, uh, but just once again, I just need to find the correct tab. Here we go. <clears throat> so here's an example. Can you see this actually? Yeah, you can. 
if you cannot read it properly or it's too small, don't worry, you're going to get a copy of it tomorrow. I want you to just understand the concept and then tomorrow you can go into the more practical side of it. And there's always a tutorial in here as well and you get it um, as part of a bonus of this free workshop. workshop. <laughs> so here we have different journals, coloring books, planners, notebooks. And what we do every single month, we look at the numbers of how many people are actively searching for things. This is super helpful for us because then we can see, ah, okay, people are actually looking for this, like a writing journal. There are over 3,400 people looking for that. And we can scroll through it. And with that, we have one piece of this market research equation. Of course, just knowing the demand is not necessarily just enough because there can be demand, but we don't know if people are actually buying it, if they're just researching it. So we always need to look at the second component of sales. Are there sales? And sales usually only come if we have competitors. So if you do have a competitor in the field of what that you want to get into, it can be a sign that there is a market. It most likely is going to be a sign that there is a market. Now, just because there is a market, it does not necessarily mean that it makes sense because we need to have we need to look also how competitive is it? Um, are we competing against sharks? Are we not? That's something that we need to consider. So once we look at our demand and we see hey there is sales, we want to look at okay what type of competitors do we have and what I want to know are there any sharks <laughs> and with sharks I mean big businesses or businesses with thousands and thousands of reviews it's very hard to compete with them unless you have something ultra unique but for our first and if it's your first product you don't really want to um, make it a really hard product to start because it's not necessary and it's not necessarily going to make things more profitable. It's not going to mean that you're going to get more sales. This is something that I often see. People see something that has a lot of search volume. Let's say um, a daily planner, like a regular daily planner without it being in a specific niche. And they think, well, they get 20, 50,000 pieces a month that they're selling. Well, then that's a product I need to go to because it has a lot of sales. But this can be super misleading because to get 50,000 sales, first off, you would have to buy that much inventory. Um, otherwise, it would be hard to compete. And then on the other side, having such strong, sharp competitors that have millions of dollars in budget, it's as a newbie, this is going to be so hard and it's not worth it. Let me show you what some of my clients have done instead. Um, share screen again. And I want to show you that you don't need the 50,000 sales a month. Here, this is one of my um, clients. They sell roughly five, 500 and 555. Well, that's a very nice number. <laughs> It fluctuates, um, but this is the number that they're making. That's already a pretty decent number, and that's what we can look for. That's when we already have a business that can fund the next product, and we don't try to just have one product that makes, you know, the hundred thousand dollars a month. We want to have a few different products, rather have a few little eggs and a bath. Uh, uh, no. That's not the best analogy, sorry. But have a few different products that will add up together. Not only will you then not have all your eggs in your basket, now it makes sense. Um, so you will um, be able to have your risk spread out. Um, but it's a lot easier to succeed because you're not competing with sharks. Um, you're competing maybe with other products that are having similar amount of sales. Um, so that makes it a lot easier. So how do we get to a product that, um, oh, sorry, Evelyn, that's monthly revenue. Um, the one that I just showed you was monthly revenue of my client. 
Um, just, I can share this again. Mm. And these are all launches that have been less than six months. Uh, sorry, that's the wrong link. Just one second. I clicked the wrong button. Share screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So these are monthly revenues. Um, and some have gone down because they're almost out of stock. So they had to increase the price as well. Um, but yeah, these are monthly revenues. And some of these products are just three months old, roughly four months, some of them, very fresh still. Um, and that's the power of Amazon, really, because you don't need 50,000 customers a month. You don't need 10,000 customers a month. You can have a few hundred a month and start building a really decent business and getting a few hundred customers a month on a platform like Amazon that has millions is not that difficult if you have this portion right. Because if you now try to compete with the big sharks, you're not going to be visible because you're not going to be on page number one, you're going to be somewhere on page number five, and then you have almost no sales. And that's why the way that I go about it, and I have all my clients go about it, is we need to find a niche. So when we do our market research, we never look for very generous things. We're not looking for just a journal, just a notebook, just a planner. No, it has to be for a topic. It has to be, for example, here I have a shadow work journal that is specifically for self-reflection. It's not a general journal. It's really for a very specific purpose. Um, I have a regular planner, but it's not a regular one. It's an ADHD planner, right? So here again, I'm targeting a specific niche. I'm not trying to please everyone. I'm only targeting a specific niche. And that's the first component. Let me then move on to the next component. <clears throat> Use, uh, use unique selling point in your content. The content cannot be just a copycat of what something else, someone else has done. It has to be a unique content and it has to stand out. The reason the clients that I just showed you have done so well is because we looked at the market, we looked at what our competitors offering and let's not offer that, let's offer something different. Let's learn from the reviews what people are liking, because from the reviews you get so much. Reading through negative reviews, reading through positive reviews, you can always combine that. You can um, put that all in ChatGPT as well, and it can give you some ideas of how to improve a product. There's so many different ways that you can create something with a unique selling point. But often I encounter people that do not create a unique selling point, they have something very similar to what's out there in the market. And then it struggles because then for a cust from a customer point of view, you would always take the product that has more reviews if, if the other one is very, very, I mean, almost looking the same. Only if it's different would you then take it. And I think that's a very normal human behavior that most people will do. That's why a unique selling point is important. What is my unique selling point here? My unique selling point with this product is that I have created a high quality um, physical product. All my competitors are print on demand. If you've ever bought a print on demand journal, it's more like, um, like a booklet, right? So quality wise, this will never fully compare. This is always going to be better quality. Also when it comes to the paper, when it comes to the colors. So my way of standing out in this market would put um, print on demand it would be already too competitive but entering as a physical product it is fine because it is unique it is different very different style to what is out there and different quality so in that aspect i have been able to create a unique selling point and unique content and this is most likely the reason why this is going to perform well long term 
going to touch on wood because I don't want to jinx myself. <laughs> but, you know, I suppose that uh, you get what I mean. Um, and then let me move to the next portion before I take too long with the first part of the workshop already. Manufacturing. And manufacturing is so important on so many different levels. And we are going to look at very common mistakes in a moment. And you're going to be like, ah, yeah, it makes sense now. Manufacturing is important because you want to have high quality for good prices. If you don't have either, if you only have good quality but bad prices, hard to compete, hard to do it well. If you only have good prices but you have bad quality, very hard to compete and hard to succeed. So we need to have both. Finding a reliable manufacturer is probably something that took me the longest in all this journey because that's not necessarily that easy. Working with American manufacturers was out of the picture because with that, that business could immediately go bankrupt because of, there's no room for profit whatsoever. So I always had to go for an overseas, man, overseas manufacturer. But going with an overseas manufacturer brings sometimes different issues like communication, expectation on quality, different standards, until you find the person that is right or the manufacturers that are right. Um, over the years, I've worked with manufacturers where I had massive disasters that cost me more than $10,000 and uh, a lot of my nerves. But over the time now, I have found three manufacturers that are super reliable and that I work with. I don't work with just one manufacturer. I spread it out because during the COVID times, I've also learned an expensive um, lesson that if you only have one manufacturer and something doesn't go well due to a lockdown or whatever, um, or a port shut down, or there was also a Shanghai port had fire, like there's so many different things that can happen. It's good to have different alternatives. So that was one thing. And here, quality and price is super, super, super important. Um, if you can't afford to make a high quality product, can you find a print on demand? With print on demand, you need to follow the print on demand route. I would not try to create a product like this with print on demand because that would cost you $25 a piece. It's impossible to be um, remotely um, profitable at all. Consider that I pay less than $2 for one piece. Uh, it's different words. So with print on demand, the only way that you can be unique is through the content as well, but that's through the content that is inside the book and the cover. But if you're trying to compete with a print on demand, you need to look for print on demand competitors. If most of your competitors are physical products, that's nothing that you want to compete with because of a physical product a new, like let's put a new physical product next to a new KDP journal. This is going to have a lot more force because it has more photos, it has more attractiveness than a regular KDP journal. But I have used KDP to fund my first projects. So I initially started with KDP print on demand. I made enough. Actually, um, I had an ADHD planner that made 10,000 in profit and that's how I invested into physical products. So it definitely works as well, but it's two different types of routes. So if you are wanting to do KDP, you can use the same demand report, the report that I just showed you, but you wanted to look at your competitors, you need to look at KDP competitors. If you have physical products as your competitors, a lot harder to do, a lot harder to succeed. I hope that Makes, uh, makes sense and clears it up a little bit. But of course that's also possible. And it's also something that I still do. Okay, so here we have talked now about the successes. Because I, I want to talk about the mistakes as well. Let's see, let's uh, get this down because I have another paper underneath. Mistakes. But from mistakes, we can learn a lot what to not do and not doing these things 
already get us on a much better position. <laughs> um, so we talked about market research. So what is the most common mistake do you think that I, <laughs> I see? <laughs> no research. So common. I, I so often see people that have a very unique idea, but they have not looked on Amazon. Hey, is this actually being searched for? They have not looked on Google. Is there anything like it out there? And then they find out after they created a whole product that actually no one's searching for it, no one is buying it. So before we start doing anything and we're going to go into product um, concept for um, transformational and coaching journeys in a moment, but we need to have this ahead of time. Next point, of course, no unique setting point having copied what worked for others or having a product that is too simple, not really adding additional value to the market. I find it is better to create a product with some content because in the end of the day, the content is truly what the person buys. We don't buy the paper. We don't just buy this book. People are buying what they get from the book. They're buying the transformation that they're wanting to get through the exercises, through the content. So if we have something that is going to provide a transformation, then we can have a unique selling point and we can add something of value that people want to buy. The next common mistake that I see that people go too broad, they don't go into a niche. So they try to sell to everyone. And the problem is when we try to sell to everyone, often we don't get to sell to no one because when we try to sell with everyone, that's where the sharks are. <laughs> the sharks tend to have more general products. Those are like the journal companies or notebook companies like Leuchtturm, maybe you've heard of it. It's a very old um, German company, actually. They sell worldwide. And they have mostly like blank notebooks and things like that. And they sell an enormous amount of journals, but they've been doing that for 110 years. And there are a lot of other companies that also do that, that are very general and that have millions and millions of dollars of budget. We want to go for the niche. We want to look for the garden journal. We want to look for the weight loss journal. We want to look for the nutrition, for the gym, for the anxiety for all of those things. I have a whole list of more than 100 um, niche ideas that you'll also be able to see tomorrow uh, as I upload them. Here, another thing that I see very common as a mistake are uh, bad quality. Choosing a manufacturer that has bad paper quality. Even if the content is good, if the quality of the paper is not great, or the book is falling, apart, the negative reviews are going to kill the product. So we want to make sure we get samples, never launch a product without getting a sample and make sure that the quality is really, really great. It's so important. This is something that many are not aware of, that seems logical and like common sense, but often it isn't and it's having a low profit margin. Many people underestimate how big of a profit margin you need to have a long-term success. Now, I said that I only pay roughly less than $2 for this book, and it says for $24.99 at the moment. For many people, that would be like, oh my God, that's outrageous. The person makes $22 in profit. That's not the reality. That's not $22 in profit because I have to ship it to Amazon. Amazon takes all the fees. I have to ship it out. Uh, you know, there's advertising. There's a lot of other things. So in the end of the day, my profit margin might be at 40%, but it's not the $20 that many people, I don't know why, assume it would be. Um, and because they have that kind of math, they think that, well, if the book costs you $8 and selling it for $24, that's very profitable. And it isn't, you know. And these 
differences in price, even if it's just a dollar sometimes, they make a big difference in volume in the long day if you're really going to be profitable and i find a lot of people buy their products for a price that is too high because they don't negotiate the price down and then they are surprised that it's not as profitable as they thought because they didn't calculate everything that goes into it in there even though i don't have to pay all these fees in advance i only pay them once i get paid they're still going to be taken away from the account, which is all natural. And I'm grateful because, look, without Amazon, I would not be able to sell the amount of products that I am. And I would not have the fulfillment. And I would live in a complete nightmare because I love creating these products. I don't want to ship any product out. Like, I'm so grateful that as soon as I get a customer, I don't even bring the customer in. Amazon brings the customer in. They will ship it to them. They will do the customer service. <laughs> like I can look into my account and see like, ah, oh, cool, 500 copies were sent today. And that's it. I don't, I don't have 500 orders that I have to now pack and ship and do all of that stuff, which would, if I had, had to hire it out, cost enormously. It would be so expensive. If I did try to do some of it alone, I would not have a life anymore. Um, so... I'm very grateful. So if they take 15% of what I make for getting me a customer, and if they take $4 to ship and do the customer service and all of that stuff, please do. <laughs> I don't want to do any of that stuff. And I'm sure that none of you would either, because at that point, that's not a business that's very enjoyable. And I've seen, I've been in touch with e-commerce businesses and e-commerce sellers that do fulfill themselves. And I know how much of a nightmare it is because you basically work 24 seven and, you know, as customer support, as shipping person, as the person who, you know, puts the product out, marketing and all of that. And at some point your pay per hour goes smaller and smaller and smaller because you're working nonstop. I, on the other hand, because I have Amazon do all of that, I can sit here in Germany and sell in the US, and I sell in Canada, just a little bit, mostly in the US, and very little in Mexico, <laughs> but really mostly in, uh, in the US. And I can do that without even touching my inventory. I have my products from my manufacturer, then directly to the Amazon warehouse, or to my warehouse that I have in the US. By now I have uh, a warehouse, you don't need that in the beginning, but I now have a lot of products, so I have an external warehouse as well. And I have that sent just directly there, and then I only touch samples. So I get samples sent to me, or I order my own product once in a while to see, okay, how does it arrive for the customer? How is the customer experience? Now, I've been able to build this business the way I have in that relatively short amount because I calculate the profit in. Not out of greed, but out of, I want to be building a business that works. Because without profit, no business. And a lot of businesses go out of business, not because there were no customers, not because there was no interest, not because the product wasn't great, but often because they ran out of money and they didn't calculate their numbers correctly. So that's essential. And that's why I love stationery because stationery has one of the biggest margins that I've ever seen because people are never buying just the paper and the book, they're buying the content. And that's why we want to go into niches because the better we can create content, that's what people are actually buying. Similar to, to a digital product, right? Like when we buy a digital product, we buy the transformation that we get from it. We're never thinking, well, I guess the seller paid only so and so much for the software to create this. Like that doesn't occur to us because we don't care about that. We create, we care about what we get for our transformation. And the same applies to this type of product. And that's why I love transformation journalists. And the last mistake that I see a lot of people make is that there's a lot of short-term thinking, not pivoting when things go wrong. I've had products that just somehow didn't perform. Like, it, like I didn't know what was happening. The photos were nice. The title was good. 
price was good, I had some reviews, like why the heck was it not selling? And it just required me to pivot a little bit. And what, what do I mean with pivot? Test a little bit a different price, test a different image, test a few different things, and then suddenly, well, okay, it started selling. And what I think a lot of us, um, and I'm very guilty of this, when we start a business, there's a lot of black and white thinking. There's a lot of like, well, it didn't work out. So I suppose this business doesn't work, this business model doesn't work, I need to try something else. And I feel like very often we are so close to the gold and we're so close to the breakthrough, but we give up before we've even tried enough, tested enough. And over the years, I have now gotten to the mindset of like, okay, I'm just going to test it. It's just a test. I'm just experimenting. I'm here just almost like a little detective and I need to figure out like, what is the correct way? I don't, well, that's a lie. I do get a bit of an emotional reaction like, oh no, but then I get over it and I'm like, okay, I don't know, Laura, we just need to test. And then it works out. Same has happened for my clients. We had product like some of the products that I just showed you, where initially, like the first two weeks, like, uh uh-uh, it didn't work. Um, And we had to make some changes, prices, um, photos, maybe some um, more reviews, and then suddenly we started picking up. Um, And this is something to really keep in mind. Let's have long-term thinking here um, and pivot enough. We will not give up right away because the success is often just after a few more tests. <clears throat> and I find that applies everywhere. Like if I'm thinking of my coaching business, it also applies. If I think of other business owners that I know, it also applies. There is sometimes a little bit of pivoting and looking what the, you know, the right path would be. <laughs> and admit that it can be easier said than done. I think it requires a little bit of practice because I feel like when things don't work out right away, it can trigger quite a bit. It can trigger like, oh, of course it didn't work because I always do things wrong or because I'm not good enough in doing business. Everyone else is. And there's like a lot of that internal drama that by the way, really everyone has or almost everyone that I've talked to has and it comes up. And you cannot believe that voice. It just really means you have to keep a little bit. And sometimes it just takes a few weeks and then it works out. Yeah. <clears throat> Being able to regulate yourself is so important, Evan. Yeah, so, so important. Great mindset to allow a launch to fail and see if that way to test rather than beating yourself up about it. Yeah, it's so important. And I think. It's such a common mistake, and it's a mistake that people often do not recognize because they think their business just failed. And one of the businesses that I first told you about that I said failed terribly, I'm going to tell you why it failed. Because I pretty much had all of these things happen. (laughs) I had um, a straightening brush that I was selling that was roughly 2016. Um, And... I had the research done, so I knew that this was something that was searched. So this was definitely something, and it was a niche, because it was like a brush. And at that time, it was relatively new still, so that was. But my quality was not good enough. I didn't have a proper, unique selling point. I had something very similar to others. And I had very low margins. One brush cost me $10 in, in manufacturing. But I could only sell it for roughly 35 ish to $40. And while it sounds like, oh, wow, but there's a lot of room, right? Like there's only $10. It isn't because the brush was bigger as well. I had to ship it. It wasn't that cheap to ship it. And I had required a lot of ads because it was extremely competitive. So here, definitely the, the competitor, like it wasn't a lot of brushes, but the competitors that I had, they were sharks. And I didn't quite realize that they were sharks. And I was actually competing with manufacturers. They were Chinese manufacturers that were selling similar products to what I was selling. 
They had very different profit margins. They had very different capacities to run ads. And it worked for some time. And then yeah, it crashed and burned because um, it was difficult. Um, and I think I could probably have done something about it, but I gave up right away. Like as soon as things started not to work, I was like, oh, this product doesn't work. <laughs> I didn't really, like I, I gave it maybe a week or two. Like if I think back, I'm like, probably this could have worked. Um, it would have been really hard because the product was not a great choice, but I could still have probably made it at work a little bit more. <laughs> but sometimes we need to make those mistakes to learn them. I hope to share them with you so you don't have to learn them by doing <laughs> um, and rather have a product that's going to be working uh, instead of making it hard. <laughs> um, okay. So I'm going to move this away for a moment and then let's look at what we want to be doing today. So we want to create a transformational journal. And a transformational journal is really there to get a person from point A to point B. And what I would like to do together with you, I would first want to know, are some of you coaches? Are some of you maybe service providers? Maybe you have courses, maybe you have memberships. Please let me know in the comments if that's what you are. And maybe we can also take an example out of the comments and see how we could create a journal out of this or a stationary product. Because it does not have to be a journal or necessarily a planner. It can also be other types of products. Although I will be mostly focusing on, uh, on, on journals today. And if you're a coach, could you also share what your niche are? Because most of you who, who are coaches, um, you're most likely in a sort of a niche, like you have a certain group of people. Um, so that would be really great to share. I personally would call myself a personal development enthusiast. I've done coaching certifications, but I've not been doing one-on-one -on -one coaching. But I always wanted to still have some form of coaching, but in a different way. <laughs> okay. Oh, I see a lot. I'm a coach of family caregivers for elders with dementia. Dementia. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, I coach women who are blended, uh, who are blending families. Okay. Memberships, ads, copywriting. I have mostly coaches and personal development enthusiast yes Evelyn <laughs> all of the above I would love to create a transformational planner around my main topic slow productivity nice that's a really nice topic <laughs> um, a woman's holistic coach I have women go through menopause with autoimmune disease very interesting uh, I'm a uh, what I'm not a coach but I have had success with my own self-development transformation I think that you don't need to be a coach necessarily to create a transformation in general, for sure. Um, mentor coach, speaker for 20 years. Nice, Tara. Okay, so we have really interesting um, different um, niches here, different people with different experiences, and I love that. Um, I uh, am leadership and wealth mentor. Cool. Very cool. Okay. So I want to very quickly, I'm just holding this now because <laughs> I love it. But also, um, jokes aside, um, it is an example of a transformational journal. Now, what does a transformational journal do and why do people buy transformational journals? Because in order to create a product that is really good for other people, we need to know where are these people coming from? And I'm not meaning location, but I'm meaning like, what is their mindset? Like, what are their desires? What are their pain points? Most people buy things because they want to get away from pain. They want to um, improve a problem or they want to get to a, towards a desire. And I would actually like to use this board again. Because I think that can 
explain this to that and I'm just going to turn it around because here there's always a reflection of the light so it's better if I use the paper and mm. so if we want to create a transformation in general we need to start with the transformation that we want to create for people so there's always a point A and a point B. That's where they are. And the point A can often be the problem that they're facing, a pain that they're having, a place where they're reflecting, this is what I want, but that's not where I am. And point B is the intended outcome. So you can think for all of your coaches, uh, for all your coaching or niches that you're interested in, what is your point A and what is your point B? I can show you what it is for this as an example, and let's take an example in a moment as well. So for the shadow work journal, what is the point A that I thought of when I created this product? This is a person that noticed that they keep getting into self-sabotage patterns. They notice that they get into the same type of relationships again and again, and they seem to not learn and still have the same problem. So there is a lot of pain that comes by noticing, oh, I tend to have the same patterns, and I feel that it's also almost automatic, right? They have the desire for better relationships, to understanding themselves better, um, healing inner wounds, and having an overall better life, I think a lot of people tend to look for happiness in that sense as well. Awesome, I see so many comments here. I will um, dive into them in a moment, okay? Love them, keep them going. <laughs> um, and process what you think the pain point of your customers are and where they want to go. And if you don't want to create a journal specific specifically for the business that you already have, think of your desired niche, roughly. Um, think of, let's say, and even if you don't know it exactly, you can also think of like, what would be the perfect journal for myself? We will still need to look at research, um, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a homework to see if there is a need for it, but I find it really helpful to think of a journal that I want to have. And for people like us that love journals, there tend to be a desire for something that doesn't exist in that way yet. Um, maybe you like gratitude journals, but the way the gratitude journals are made is not what resonates with you. You would like to have it differently. Or you're into manifestation. You see that there are manifestation journals out there, but you would want to have yours being differently. And if you have a little bit of an idea, let's say, oh, yeah, I like manifestation. So I want to look at, okay, what's the pain point? Where do they want to go? <clears throat> awesome. I see some A's already. Really good. Because in the end of the day, we want to map out a journey for them. And we want to not just create random exercises, but we want to make something that feels and flow. Do you know what I mean? Have you ever had a journal in your hand where you feel like, huh, this is intuitive, this makes sense? Um, or have you ever had a journal or planner in your hand to try to do everything that you were like, wow, I don't want to use this. <laughs> this is too much. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. And what I do then when I'm thinking of creating a transformational journal, um, I then start putting things in between the A and the B where I feel like this could help. So what I've done in this book, for example, um, I looked into how shadow work can specifically help and people that are into shadow work don't know how to do it, how they can help the help to get it done. Mm. I had quite a few that weren't. <laughs> I, had some, I had some that clearly were created by people who don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. I'm like, what the heck is this now? <laughs> yeah. And 
when it comes to guided journals, there, there are some good quality ones, but it's still, we are in the infancy stage of this industry. And when you look at the um, workbook tomorrow, you will see, um, as a, I have like a statistic of how the market is growing and how things are changing in this um, niche. And you'll see that. And I found that there's no coincidence that so many of my clients' products have done so well so quickly. Of course, we've done a great job in creating a nice product and my clients have done an amazing job in um, having nice content. Like I'm not wanting to diminish that at all, but I want to acknowledge that it's just an am amazing time right now too because the competition isn't really that strong yet because the guided journaling world is just really getting started. And I think in five years, it's going to look very different. And I'm hoping, my mission is that in five years, it's going to be a lot of our people having all cool things out there and helping, having impact um, on different groups of people with cool journals. Okay. Um, I continue. Um, okay. So, at my point A, I see a lot of nice point A's and point B's. I need to get to point B for my client. So here I thought of some content. You can't see it here, but I can read a few things. So what did we do? We explained a little bit how shadow work works, and then we walked through some exercises to help in a child work. Shadow work prompts to find what are unconscious triggers. And we try to make it as simple to understand, but yet as valuable as possible. I actually sat down with one of my best friends who is a psychologist to really make sure that this is sound too, and that I'm not creating something that might not be, you know, of as much help as I would hope. But what, in order to do this, what we did is we actually use post-its and I always use post-its when I create a new thing. And I usually use my big um, whiteboard. I had one in really big. I put my point A, I put my point B. And then I write down what it is. Okay, so in your case, it might be you want to have a certain exercise. So you want a clarity exercise. Um, you might want to have some goal setting for your niche. And you start putting down all the different things that you feel will get the person from point A to point B. And at this point of time, we can really dump all our ideas here. There are no dumb ideas. We're not going to censor ourselves. We're going to stop ourselves. Because later on, there's an additional step that is going to help us clean this up and make sure, like, is this truly helping or is this me just trying to stuff it? Because there is a tendency, and I've had that, and I had some journals, I still have one journal where I feel like, oh, I stuffed it, I need to um, redo that particular journal. Um, but sometimes we can have the, the tendency of wanting to add a lot of stuff into it because we feel like the more we add, the more value we give. But in a journal, that's not always the case because if we add a lot, we can have a lot of overwhelm. So what I try to do, I try to see myself as my own customer and I try to sort of imagine myself going through the journal. And I imagine like, okay, would it be helpful for me to have like some intention setting here? Okay, it would. Do I then also need goal setting? And do I then also need something else? Maybe not. Maybe that would be just redundant. And we want to, while we put everything out, later on still look and not keep everything in. And we still need to look at that. Okay, let me see the different answers that we have here. Um, Jacqueline. So point A is overwhelmed, hustle, fuzzled. Uh, I don't know, frazzled, hustle, hustle, hustle. Ah, okay, it's hustling, <laughs> uh, unorganized in biz, and B would be have clarity in business, have a good overview of what they need to do and when, 
Um, and then from hustle, going to slow productivity mindset. I really love that. <clears throat> cool. And then I think you can think now, like what would be some things that would help that person specifically get more clarity and help them figure out how they can be in slow productivity. So it might be some exercises in the beginning. It might be some form of prompts that help them realize, oh, get more awareness of where they get to, tend to get to a hustle mode. Maybe you can give them like a short plan. Like here, these are the five step plan of how we are slowly improving and getting out of the hustle. Um, that's where you can think of like, what do you think would make your product the product that you would like to have? And I don't feel like when it comes to the content, there's not necessarily always a right or wrong. I think if you are your own ideal best customer, you know that there's a market out there, you know that you are the type of person who would buy it. Trust that the way you feel is right can be right. Not everyone is going to agree with all the types of different types of journals. There are people who like to have two page spread. There are people who like to have just one page a day. Some people want it guided. Some people want a little bit more room. Create what you feel is the best and trust that the people who are like you will find it. And they can through good pictures through showing what it is inside, to really saying like, hey, this is a productivity journal to, you know, you could probably use words like burnout as well, like to reduce the burnout risk. Actually, we've created a, a similar product to yours, which sells good. Um, and there's a big productivity niche on Amazon, which I think is very interesting. Um, so, you can create what something that you would want. And that has to do with everything that comes with it. Most of my products are um, case bind. That's my, that means that it has no spiral because I'm not a spiral user. And usually when I do these workshops, I tend to ask like, hey, do you prefer to have spiral or do you prefer to have like a, you know, a case bound um, planner or journal? And it's usually 50-50. And there's no right answer, really. Like, you don't have to do spiral because that will, is better. Or you don't. The only thing that you can do if you notice that most of your co uh, competitors are spiral, then you can have your product be non-spiral to have a pattern interrupt, to be different to what's out there. But other than that, there's not going to be, like, a product that's not going to do well because it isn't. And you always have the possibility of doing both. I have a product. I started it as case bomb. I then got contacted by customers. Hey, could you make it spiral? Because I prefer spiral. I'm like, huh, I didn't think about it because I don't make spiral, but let's do it. And then we did it and then people loved it. So, and there's really that 50-50, some people prefer it this way, some people prefer it that way. And you get to do it the way you want to do it. And if you later on want to release the other form, go for it. You can also do it. <laughs> but don't feel like you need to create something that you yourself wouldn't want it that way to please a market. Because there is no pleasing a market. Because I see the market a bit as like a beast <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> It wants different things and it wants everything. And you will have people that like one thing, you will have people that like other things. And you will never be able to please everyone, but you can trust that you can find people that like the same thing as you. As long as you have, have found a market that actually gets sales and you look through some of the reviews and see what people actually do, like if there's like a very strong Thing that they don't like okay that's something that you can listen to but other than that you are free to create the journal the way that you would like it but here it's important to keep in mind that you need to be your ideal customer yourself to create something that you really like if you would never use that type of journal anyway it's going to be a lot harder and then it requires you to do a lot more in-depth research 
it's a lot easier to create a product that you want to use and you want to create for yourself <clears throat> or for your client. You know, it does not have to be for you, but for your client. And most likely you will understand your client the best as well. <clears throat> what about creating a journal? Um, here. What about creating a journal that is part of an online course you're selling? Couldn't cross sell. Couldn't it cross sell your course? Yes, this is a really important thing. Now, as a coach, course creator, membership owner, you can use your product to get warm leads. You can have your QR code with a freebie, get people on your email list. You can directly sell a program in the back of a book. Um, I actually once talked to Evelyn about it. I said, well, if I had a shadow work membership, this would be so cool because I could get a lot of different um, customers in my shadow work membership if I, if I ever had one. Um, but uh, if the product is in a niche of something that you're anyway already doing, then getting customers from Amazon not only will give you a profit, but also that can lead to clients and to really good clients because, and I mean, good with people that are very interested because they've already um, worked with what you've got. They're already like, liking what you have and then they can upgrade into your membership or maybe you have one-on-one -on -one coaching or group coaching or any other services. Um, you can definitely, this, I can especially imagine that a lot with like, let's say um, anything that has to do also with weight loss, um with adhd like if i had like an adhd membership i would put that in there i think it would work really really well um especially considering we get so many sales thousands and thousands and thousands of thousands of sales um so yeah you can also add that for your membership and there's no exact rule of um you can only do this or do that you can make this benefit your product business or your service business and your personal brand as well you don't necessarily have to write a whole book to benefit from the increased authority credibility because let's say you are um, a coach for let's say <coughs> weight loss and you have like a really good cool weight loss planner and you have someone new in in your email list or so, and then you present them like that, that's something that you're doing. I find that also increase quite a bit of like your credibility, like, oh, wow, I can find a product on Amazon, look at the reviews, look like, oh, okay, this person is legit. It's not just someone who, you know, uh, started weight loss coaching right now. It gives an added um, credibility, similar to writing a book, I find. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm in the process of taking another transformation course, but they do not have any journal or prompts or anything like that. Is it okay to make my own up without ripping um, off their work? <clears throat> um, I'm not sure I fully understand, but I guess the course is for a certain topic and you want to create a journal for that particular topic. As long as the topic is not trademark or there's like any sort of like, I don't have enough context to really give you an exact answer. But let's say it is a transformational um, program around the topic of weight loss. Let's say that again. Um, you could create your own weight loss planner, even though you went to a, uh, a course, but you don't, you, you obviously don't want to take the material, just create your own. Um, and yeah, for sure. I mean, we all have benefited from different things that we have learned over the years, as long as we still make it our own and make sure that there's no copyright infringement, no trademark infringements, then we are good. Is it an option to have a ledger size book? Any size of book is possible. Um, it comes down again to profitability, pricing, quality, um, and something that you need to look into. But yeah, for sure. I use usually this size, 
because I personally like that size and because I like the size pricing. It's a standard size A5, and that's what all of my products are. Um, but there are a lot of other standard size too that a manufacturer could definitely do for you. Um, okay, wonderful. Do we have any additional questions to this portion here? Just let me know. Uh, I see some more questions that I have missed earlier. Ah, uh, Bond makes me think it is a book. I wouldn't write in a book. That said, I'm drawn to the look and feel of a Bond book. Yeah, me too. I feel very drawn to it. And it's okay for people to have different preferences and different things that um, they like. In the end of the day, it both sells, it both works. <laughs> um, and I have not seen a clear preference or that something says significantly more than the other, which is good. There's always going to be people liking either or, or some like both. Kathy is asking, what about creating a journal that is part? Ah, I already answered that, sorry. Um, do you feel it needs to be niched? I feel that most topics need to be niched um, because it makes it easier for people to find you. If we go general, it's hard to be on top of the page. If you use Google, I'm sure if you use Amazon, you barely go, very rarely go further than page number three. Most people don't even go further than page number one. On page number one, we have 48 different products most cases. On the phone, we have 20, but on the phone, it grows further, so it's a little bit different. In order to get most sales, we need to be on the first page and ideally on the uh, top half. So top 20 is what gets your sales. If we go very general without going into a niche, we don't truly really know what the intention is of the person buying it. I always say the buying intention. So if someone is saying they're looking for a journal, just a, I don't know what type of journal they want. It could be that they're just looking for a notebook. They could be looking for something else. If now someone is looking for a manifestation journal, I know the purpose. I know the intention, what the person is looking for, of what the person is looking for. They're looking for a journal that will help them manifest. If they're looking for a manifestation journal, three, six, Nine, I know exactly what they want. Manifestation journal with the me method 369. There's not always going to be enough search volume for a small niche, but sometimes and often there is. For example, gratitude journal for men, right? So here I know exactly what they want. It could be that some men just look for journal. So to be in a top 20, it's going to be a lot harder because we don't clearly know what the person wants. And as soon as we go a bit in a niche, we never 100% know what they want, but we can make a very good educated guess. If someone is looking for gratitude journal for kids or journal for kids, we know that this is the niche that we can be in and we can create a, a journal specifically for kids. So we need to always make sure that we are in a niche if we go too broad, if we want to say something that is for everyone, that's always danger zone in the sense of very hard to get visibility. And that's why you need to put a lot of additional effort in marketing it outside. <clears throat> um, I think you skipped my question. Are you going to talk about nuts and bolts of creating KDP file? Or do you recommend outsourcing? Mm, I do talk about that in my membership, which is specifically about KDP. Today, as I'm talking about selling journals on Amazon, I'm talking about selling physical books on Amazon, which is a little bit different, but in the same, sim in a way still similar. Um, creating a KDP file, we tend to recommend Canva. And KDP, for everyone who's not sure what that is, it's basically print and demand, what I showed you just here as well, which is something that I've also done. And when we look at the different things that led to my success, 
one of them has been KDP. One of them has been testing different things through KDP, print on demand, no risk, and funding my ideas. Um, but the practical thing of uploading things like that, um, we do have in um, in in our club. That's how it's called, and we do have a lot of different. Um, templates and things like that and it starts for seven dollars a month and i recommend checking that out there because it's just a, a tutorial that you can watch and download your canva file and then upload it onto amazon which is going to be the way that we do it with kdp which is a very fantastic way because it gives the possibility of starting faster um, for a lot of my ideas some of my breakthrough journals which was ADHD, an ADHD planner, and also a manifestation journal. I both started with KDP when they started selling really well. I had a lot of profit. I had more than $10,000 in royalties, which is the profit when you um, sell print on demand on Amazon. I then was able to reinvest that into physical products. So there is a nice way of combining both and using print on demand as a way to fund your ideas but in order to really go where big physical product is the solution because uh, that will never compare to um, a kdp um, i personally have sold kdp a lot but i'm not a user of these type of kdp journals because i really like quality <laughs> journals but a lot of people don't mind it you know again with the different preferences there are so many different preferences these type of KDP journals, they sell enormously well. Um, actually, last year, probably you've all heard about it. There's been a, a journal that went viral, the Shadow Work Journal, which was just a print-on-demand KDP journal. And she was um, making around a million dollars in royalties a month for a couple of months, which was crazy, 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 crazy. So I'm not saying that this doesn't work. It also works. It's just um, a different type of you know, and you can always do start with one, do then the other, do it at the same time, all possible. Yeah. <clears throat> Should we test our ideas with KDP and then publish the same journal as a book? Sometimes that is possible. Sometimes it isn't. Here again, we need to look at the market research because with KDP, we can usually only compete with other KDPs. If we see a lot of physical books, it's a lot harder to compete. With a physical book, we can, however, compete with other physical books a lot easier. So sometimes you have maybe an idea for, let's say, a specific type of gratitude journal. And you really would like to do that niche, um, but it is for KDP, that's super competitive. But for physical product, it would still be fine. So sometimes there is that. Sometimes it works. So there's unfortunately not a clear answer that I can give right away. Um, it depends on, um, on the research. And one piece of research that I'm going to give you as a homework as well is whatever niche idea you have, you need to go on Amazon and search for it. And you want to look. Do I have competitors? Write down, are most of my competitors physical products? Are most of them KDP? And in order to recognize that, um, I want to show you a quick example. Um, just going to share this. Um, I'm going to go on uh, wrong. Amazon. Yeah, here we go. You can see this, right? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm always worried I'm not playing my screen. Okay, let's look at a KDP example. So that would be Gratitude Journal for Kids as an example. Um, here we see a lot of KDP. How do we recognize it? Usually it says paperback. And do you see this image? It looks like a flat poster, like a flat image. That's when we recognize, in most cases, it's accurate to like roughly 90%. Sometimes it's not 100%, but 90%, you can already estimate, okay, here, this is KDP, this is KDP, this is KDP, this is KDP. This isn't, right? You have, here we have a photo. Now let's see the contrast. So here we, you would compete mostly with KDP. Okay, 
Let's look for just a general gratitude journal to see the contrast. Um, and here you suddenly, look, these are all physical. We have some KDP here, but they have tons of reviews, thousands of reviews. But mostly here we do have physical books. Now, if you want to do KDP, you want to try to have most of your competitors being KDP as well. <clears throat> and that's why we do have the, yeah, the demand report to help you find out, okay, and I've done this um, within our KDP. We have a KDP-specific membership where I've done some niche research um, and we looked at um, different niches that I looked out here. In a matter of 30 minutes, I found three niches that would do really well in KDP right now. And one particular niche that could also do well as a physical product later on that you could test as KDP and then later on um, run as a physical product. There are definitely a lot of them still out there. It might not be um, the general gratitude journal, it might not be the manifestation journal because those are a little bit more saturated for KDP. But there are thousands of different types of things that people are searching for. And I promise you, there's so many things in between where you could do exactly that route. You just need to find or figure out for yourself, is this the topic I really want to go into? Otherwise, you say, okay, I'm going to start KDP with topics I might not be fully interested, maybe for funding purposes, or I'm going to use KDP not necessarily to get sales, but to have a printed version of my concept and to test my concept and maybe give it to some people to get some feedback. So that could also be a way that you can utilize KDP in form uh, as a form of validation and to help create your content. Um, I have loved to use KDP as a form um, of funding and validation. And within our KDP club, by the way, the KDP club is, <clears throat> is basically a, a monthly group coaching um, membership where we look specifically into KDP. And... I lost what I want to say. I want to say something specific about it. Mm -hmm. Maybe it'll come back to me. <laughs> I lost it. <laughs> Sorry, sometimes that happens. Uh, what do you want to say? Hmm. Oh, yeah. I've used KDP specifically to fund, and I've also used um, KDP to um, just for the concept. And in the club, we've also um, explored other methodologies like TikTok and so to be able to get more sales. So you don't have to fully depend on the Amazon um, search volume either. Like, and this is, I think, something that I want to really pass on to you. There's not just one right way, right? Like take this as your support, as a way of navigating and finding more clarity of what you can do. But don't be shy to add a few extra things and add your own twist because you don't have to rigidly do exactly the same. The only way where you want to be a little bit more rigid is really when it comes to figuring out is there really a market for it. Um, I hope that I um, explained a little bit more. <laughs> okay. Oh, quite a few questions. Um, Evelyn, would you recommend finding winning KDP journals and make your own, so not looking at the content, but using the same idea and creating a physical book like that? Um, yeah. Um, the Shadow Work Journal, uh, for example, all of my competitors are KDP, and they were doing really, really well in KDP. And that... I, I used to have a, K, a shadow work journal as well as KDP, but I didn't start again with a new KDP shadow work journal. I rather dove into physical right away because it was enough um, proof of concept and proof of product for me to know like, okay, this is going to sell. <clears throat> Would you then filter by hardback? No, I don't filter by hardback at all. 
because usually hardback, when it says hardback, it could also be print on demand and it could be through publishers. So I want to try to always compare apples with apples. So if it's KDP, it usually will say paperback. And KDP also has a hardback option, but that's, I don't recommend it. Quality is not great and pricing is horrible. Mm. Is the trend report based on searches or purchases? And um, searches. Mm. Based on the past 30 days. We use a software called Helium 10 for that. Um, and every month we do that research for you. Mm. Which membership is KDP? I just signed up for one of your memberships. Um, the KDP membership is called The Club. Let me show you all my memberships. And I do have a nice offer where everything is in one. So you can get that and then put all the different components together. You can do the KDP while you're um, working on a physical product. And let me share what is all in there as well. Because if we look at the different things that were important for me to um, create, what I have been able to create, one was the market research, one was creating content that um, has a unique selling point and the manufacturing. And what we have tried to do in our programs, let me quickly share this. Um, I'll share my screen. So here, this is Genesis and Planet Pro, and it's a 12 month program with group coaching that helps you put everything that we have talked here together when it comes to the creation of the product, creating transformational journeys and manufacturing them. So it includes the market research, how to do it, and then how to create your product and how to manufacture it. In fact, I am introducing you to my manufacturers that I have over the past years found and been able to create good relationships with. With every manufacturer that I introduce you with, I have worked either for years and with all of them, I spent at least $100,000 in purchases from them. Not the revenue that I got later, like I spent $100,000 plus with them. So these are manufacturers that are vetted. I have had my customers, um, like I've done, done, done for you services and one-on-one -on -one services. All of my customers have gone through them as well. I'm not affiliated with them at all. I don't gain by you working with them. All that I gain is that you have a good experience because this is crucial. <clears throat> We have group calls with them. Let me scroll down to, see, to show you what is all in here. So inside Journeys and Planners Pro, you get group calls with me three times a month. And then we have one implementation week. I live for the implementation because we can do all sorts of learning and content all day long. If we don't implement, there's not going to be any results. So we need the results in the end. We have the impl Im implementation week. We have content coaching from our content coach. And our content coach is a previous one-on-one -on -one client that has done well with her journals. She's also a professional content creator and copywriter, and she's going to support you map out your journal, creating the content for it. We also have twice a month calls with our manufacturers. You can talk to them, you introduce to them. And basically all of the things that you need to be able to create a journal or planner. But not only that, you also get 12 months for your access to our KDP Club. So as I was telling you that you can use KDP as a form to fund your project, it's also in there. Usually it's $49 a month, but you get it included because I have a lot of my customers that like to do both. So they do KDP first and they use the funding or they want to just uh, confirm an idea. Um, they want to try and test. They want to get some practice. There's a lot of different reasons why people want to start with KDP first. So it's all included. It also includes 
the royalties accelerator this is a really cool new membership that we just um, released earlier this year and it has thousands and thousands of pages on canva of different journals and later on i can show you how it looks inside and you have um, templates for so many guided journals we have um, prompt banks so you have different prompts for different topics we have clip art in there that you can use for your kdp but you can also use that for your physical product to plan out or even to use that with your designer or if you decide to design yourself as well um, we also include the trend report every single month the trend report is there and there's also coaching calls what is special about our coaching calls is we do a lot of hot seat coaching. So we do have some Q&A portion, but you can always apply. And then we'll have 30 minutes, you and me, and then we create work on your product, create a listing or what, whatever is needed to support you wherever you're stuck. We also have a mindset call and co-working sessions with other members. So we do quite a bit in order to support you to get to the finished result, which is holding your first sample in your hand and then continue your journey to sell it. Now, Journals and Planners Pro usually does not include any of the Amazon selling. Now, this is the first time that I'm here on school and it's the first time that I'm doing a launch here on school. And we decided, you know what, for this 48 hours, we're going to bring our all-rounder path back. This is usually not available at all because this all-rounder path includes my Amazon course too. So if you want to not only create a stationary product, and by the way, this could also be other stationary products like <clears throat> guided pads, it could be affirmation cards, and that can be all done by the same manufacturers too. Um, but if you want to say like, hey, I want to also sell on Amazon, <laughs> I want to do exactly the same thing you are doing, with the KDP, with creating stationary products and selling on Amazon, we have the all rounder pass. It's for 12 months, access to everything for 999. If you would get it all separately, um, and after the 48 hours, it's not available anymore, separately, everything is $3,000 in total. So it's quite a big saving because the product launch school itself is a course and <clears throat> group coaching as well with weekly calls. And um, it on its own is 777 if you purchase one time. Many people do the monthly option, it's 97. So if we put everything together, 97 here, 97 there a month, then um, the, 30, uh, the 49 of the club, it together comes to roughly $3,000. And then with a 9.99 for this special school occasion, you get to have the all-rounder pass, which we are reopening for this 48 hours. And that includes everything. So make sure that you have the link out there as well. And here's a short video as well that is going to describe what's all included in there. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. I'm happy to answer everything. And for those of you who are who've never maybe been to a workshop, have never you know um, been to to any of the launches that I do, um, you might not know that I only started um, inspired through Evelyn Weiss to create a program that is a lot more affordable because I used to do six months group coaching for five thousand dollars just before I released this. So it's the first time I'm offering it for this price. <coughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Gosh. Okay, do we have any questions? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. Can you talk um, about your offer? <clears throat> yes. Um, that's um, please drop the website for us in the chat. Oh, of course. Sorry, <laughs> that makes sense. <clears throat> yes, I'll have a drop then. Huh? 
Let me know if you can see it. Mm. What resources would you recommend for master recent rights on journal templates? I'm not unsure if I understand the question fully. Um, maybe you could reword it. I'm not fully understanding the question. <clears throat> Can you share your link? Yes, I shared the link. <laughs> I, I should have shared it right away. Um, text someone in your home to bring someone. I my husband is not home, so I'm like, oh, okay. But I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> it doesn't look like it has an Amazon portion for the monthly payments. It doesn't have an Amazon portion for the monthly payments, so the 999 is a special offer that we usually don't offer. And we do have a Klarna link, so basically a Stripe link that offers Klarna, which is the pay later option. So anyone who would like to have a payment option, it is done through our Stripe account, but that requires a separate link that we can um, give out as well. Um, what is the approximate investment to start making profit? Not including your program. I recommend, <clears throat> depending on the product, having roughly $5,000. Gives you a bit more wiggle room. Um, that's, you can, of course, start with a cheaper product that might only cost you $2,000. And that's also something that I've done. So my first stationary product was actually a habit tracker. And the habit tracker was less than a dollar per product, was very profitable. And I my investment was, I think, even just 1,500 or so. It was quite low. Um, so you can start with less, but maybe it uh, is a product that is more like a notepad or might be a product, even affirmation cards can be cheaper too, or uh, something like this. Would be cheaper as well so there's a lot of other things that you could do that also cater towards a transformation towards a niche that would be less if you wanted to start like that that's also how i got started um and um but yeah for a nice banner that's what i would roughly estimate to have because you want to have some photography done as well and with five thousand, you have a good have good room. <clears throat> yes, I want to create Oracle card. Um, is there a link for Amazon selling courses on it on its own? Or a deal on KDP? Well, the Amazon course does not include the manufacturing portion. So at least not the printing manufacturing. I would recommend getting the all access, basically all courses, even if you're not going to use KDP, <clears throat> it's a better deal still. It's the best deal that we have, even if you're not going to use everything. And you don't know, maybe you want to use something else um, later on as well. Um, so that's what I would recommend. Um, if I don't want to do KDP, what would be a reason of expectations to start up cost? What I just said, roughly, for a really nice high quality, I would I think roughly 5,000 for sure. I think master resale rights could be challenging because Amazon might think we don't have the rights to sell the content and restrict your account. I agree with Evelyn. Um, need to be cautious there. I would not buy Etsy templates too much. I would be cautious where you get your templates. Always, if you use templates, make them your own. You don't want to sell something someone else owns. Very important. It's better to have spent a bit extra time than trying to just take a template and upload it as it is. That usually leads to trouble. <clears throat> is there a link to your course? Yes, there is. Let me just post it again in the chat. How much does it cost if you start with KDP first? Um, nothing. And you can do it all through Canva. You don't have to invest. However, if you're launching and you want to rank your product, you might have to invest a little bit of time if you don't want to invest in ads. I usually recommend investing into ads, and that can be as little as $50 to $100. Um, but um, you can also do that by just promoting it in, in a group, and that can also work. 
but you can start it with zero dollars, which is the benefit, yeah, the clear benefit. Could you also have with affirmation cards in the program? Yes, absolutely. Affirmation card was my second stationary product, actually. And uh, this is something that many of my clients have done. Oracle cards as well, tarot cards. Um, prompt cards. We have right now someone in Judas Planets Pro creating, oh, so beautiful. she's a teacher. She's creating these amazing cards for kids. Yeah. Any type of paper product is something that we cover and the manufacturers can help you. Would you mind going over the product the offer again? Because I want to make sure I understand what we're getting in each. Yes, I'm happy to do that. Um, so I would go uh, into, hold on, am I sharing my screen? No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have a few different programs, a total of four. Judas and Planners Pro is basically the program that's going to help you do the market research, create a transformational product, no matter if it's a journal, no matter if it's a planner, any type of stationary product, it's going to connect you with the manufacturers. And we do that through... Um, being able to ask for a quote through forms that we have and through calls. So we have three calls with me and the calls with me are for market research, product validation, um, thinking about content, you can also do that with me, and um, conceptualizing strategy around like how you want to stand out, unique selling points. These are what the calls are for. And we have them three times a month, basically weekly. And then one week a month, we have an implementation week. That's where we have a lot of co-working sessions um, where we have a lot of focus on implementing the things that we discuss. We have weekly coaching calls for content creation. That's all about creating your unique selling point through your content. And we have twice a month calls with our manufacturers. These are my manufacturers that I introduce you to. You can ask your questions, they can show you samples, and they do all these calls. The group calls with me are one on, not one-on-one, -on -one, they are hot seat. So others can watch, and you can have 30 minutes roughly, and then we can go through anything that you're stuck in. Um, I find that those are very beneficial for everyone who's watching, and of course for the person who's going through it. Then that's what the regular thing is that I offer. This is... Um, However, something special, the 999 offer is all rounder pass. It means get access to all my memberships. That includes the product launch school. The product launch school, similar to the Junus and Planets Pro, is a program that has the goal of going to the next step. So when your Junus and Planets Pro, you're ended and you have the product then you want to ship it to Amazon and you want to start selling on Amazon. And that's where the product launch school picks up and helps you launch on Amazon. And here again, we have three coaching calls, one on one, on one hot seat um, in there. And we also have an ads guy who can then review your ads and look at how that works. If you know if there's any improvement needed or not. We have co-working sessions. Uh, implementation week so there's some similarities in how they set up it's just it has a different goal one is to launch on amazon the other one is to actually create the product and then what you get as a bonus is the kdp club which is this one here which is all about print on demand that you can do additionally to test your product um, to have a prototype to have um, additional income there are a lot of different things that you can do with it. I've used KDP for the longest time as an additional income stream as well and um, to fund my ideas and to play around in different niches and to have like faster, <laughs> you know, it's a faster process because you don't need to wait for the manufacturing. You can basically create it on Canva and there's a lot more wiggle room because if you have a spelling mistake, you can just like download it, like change the interior pages and just very quickly. So there's a lot of benefit in adding KDP to the whole process. It's not a must, 
but I found it a very crucial component in my success because it has added um, enormously into having more funds, especially at the time when I didn't have them. Um, so it was very beneficial to have that in addition. So that's included. And because I know that creating products, um, KDP products, cannot always be as easy when you just have a wide screen in front of you. Like I work best with templates, and that's why we have thousands of pages and we have a dozen different topics as well. And every month we add new topics, new planner topics that we have researched through the demand report, which you also get every month a demand report. Um, so you know what the trends are. And um, also, um, what do I want to say? Ah, oh, yeah. And templates for coloring books, templates for journals, for planners, for covers, clip art. Then you have um, prompts that you might want to add. So you have like a prompt bag. So you know, oh, okay, these are gratitude prompts. I can add, you know, I can say, take some of these prompts for my journals. So it makes the whole process easier because it removes some of the creative burden that we can have when we create a product. It makes it a lot easier. I love starting with templates, even if I change it up totally later on, but it's, it's nice to have that skeleton already. Now, if I have a wide screen in front of just a wide page, I'm not, I'm not that creative to know like, okay, now I put a line here and this, but if I already have a page, I know how to move things around or change the text, you know, or change the font, it's a lot easier. And once the momentum gets going, I get really started and actually get something done. Otherwise, I can be a bit in overwhelm land. <laughs> yeah, and that's basically for 48 hours, we have the 9.99 offer um, that we opened because we, um, Evelyn and I, we um, like school. I th we think school is so beautiful and interesting and we decided, hey, why not do a workshop on school? And we wanted to offer something and that's uh, like opening an offer that usually is closed. Um, and we tend to have these type of launches just a few times a year. So it's not very open, that, not very often that this is open, um, but right now it is open for the 48 hours. Did that, um, Make it clear. If there's any additional questions, feel free to ask. Um, I'm happy to, to answer any additional questions. Mm, Evelyn, 50 to 100 per day or how long? Oh, no, 50 to 100 for like two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Is there a way? people can start that have low funds to build some funds then afford to go to the next stage. Yes, through KDP, you don't need funds to start KDP. When I got started, I also didn't have a lot of funds. Uh, I had a lot of ideas and things that I want to do, but I needed to also support my family and all of that. I had a baby at the time. So I also used KDP. Oh, Tara, well, you cannot find my journals under my personal name because I am selling through brands. So here you see, there's a brand name here. Um, there's never my personal name on any of these. And I have, I think, two KDP journals that are under my name, but that is um, from a different... I just made a mistake there because usually I use always pen names. I always stay very anonymous with my KDP, especially because KDP is so easy to copy since it is very easy to upload. For my physical products, I'm a lot more transparent because this would be a lot harder to copy. <laughs> and while I like to openly share everything, I still need to have my own business in mind. Um, so this is one and the other brand is called um, Epic Self. <clears throat> Uh, is there a link to your seven dollar membership? Yes, there is. Um, and I will have that with you as well. Um, just give me one second. Mm. 
Okay. Uh, is it a lifetime course? Is it a lifetime course? Do you pay yearly? It's a 12 month group coaching program. Um, it is purposefully done that way. I've had lifetime courses in the past and uh, the human nature, the way that we are, we tend to not do things if there's not a deadline. <laughs> so it's for 12 months and also we add a lot of support and that is the only way to be able to have long-term great support and not have just a course without any support. That's why we do it yearly. Yeah. Is it a self-study um, program or guided cohort? Um, self-study program with live classes here and there as well as we add them. Um, the good thing through having a community and having many regular calls, we get a good feeling of where people are at and what is needed. Um, so we, uh, you know, had some, oh my God, so true, I need all the deadlines. Yeah, without a deadline, you know how many courses I've got that I've opened a few times <laughs> and then, whoo. Um, and I find that programs where there's a lot of in-person action through group calls um, or through co-working, I find co-working makes an enormous um, difference. So we have a lot of co-working and with, I know, okay, I have this time, that's when I do the things. Um, if I joined a $97 a month course, would that help me first with KDP product launch? Then I can make some money and then upload to the next stage. Yes, D, you could. Um, you can could join us for the $97 a month. It does not include the Amazon launch for a physical product, but it does include the KDP portion. Like, it does include the templates. So you still have the whole journal side, the print on demand and the physical journal side. It's just if you then want to, um, um, you know, sell on Amazon, then you would then move on to also get the product on school if you want to learn through us. <clears throat> How do I find your newest journal? Okay, so the newest journal I just launched 10 days ago, so it's not 100% findable uh, so far, <laughs> um, but it will be very soon. Let me just get the link for you. Um, Shadow Walk Journal, Luminous Path. I sent you out the link. There you go. Oh, we got, during this call, we got a new review. <laughs> Every day I'm refreshing to see. <laughs> new. That's very exciting in the beginning stages. Um, oh, this is a very long. Um, wow, maybe that doesn't work. It does, uh, hold on, let me give you a different link that was way too long. <clears throat> But yeah, this is my new launch. It just went live on the 1st of April. And I'm very happy. Yesterday, we already got hot. We had five sales come on their own already, which is very exciting. It's just the beginning stages, but, you know, five sales on their own. It's really cool. Just after 10 days. Awesome. <laughs> so very excited. My goal was this. Um, general is to get it to $85,000 a month in revenue within a year. That's my goal. <clears throat> mm. Laura's right. I have invested in lifetime with good intentions and then not engaged because I know it's there. Yeah. I'm shifting as I don't want that behavior for my clients. And the problem is also if someone offers lifetime, they will not be able to afford good support because how are you going to be paying for a team and all of that to offer long-term um, support? So often lifetime courses are just courses with you know a platform where you can log in, but there's no, no community or there's no co-working or there's no, no additional coaching or Q&As. And I find that having the possibility to talk to other people is is crucial um, for accountability, but also not to feel alone, to bounce ideas, to brainstorm together. Very important. 
Mm. Are the templates in the royalties program going to prevent rankings or publishing on Amazon since they're being given to all members? How do you avoid duplication? I recommend making your changes. Templates are there not to take them and download them and upload them. I've seen a lot of people do that on KDP and I don't recommend that route. They are there and you will see once you open them, often they have like 50 pages or 20 pages and they're like unique pages that you can just take something that fits. Maybe you can take a coloring page that fits. You can combine different things that you find work well and look well and then you will automatically have something unique. But I recommend you to make some changes, change the fonts, make them are the same because if you're match matching, it could be that they're different fonts. Um, and use that as a way to remove creative burden and make it a lot easier for you to start. But um, just taking templates, and that doesn't matter where you get the templates, if you get them on Etsy anyway, just taking tem templates and going to uh, um, upload them is not going to be uh, a route that really leads to a lot of success. Um, but having support and getting started can lead to success because it removes the overwhelm in the beginning and gets some momentum done. And when it comes to ranking, um, no, it does not. Um, everyone still does their own thing. And you will notice in the community that not everyone's doing the same thing. Everyone has their own niches, own interests. When you create their own things with Canva, they use some of the templates and make something of their own out of it. <clears throat> um, Laura, do you have a shadow work kind of also on, on Amazon in Europe? I personally don't sell on Amazon Europe, but Amazon buys products from me and sells them in Europe. So they sell them in Germany and they sell them in the UK. Um, it's a higher price because they just buy it from me and sell it there. Um, but yeah, it is available in Germany and it's available in the UK. You can also, if you ever wanted to buy it, you could also buy it from .com and then have, I think there's an additional shipping cost of, I think, eight euro. Yeah, but it ships worldwide. That's the beauty of Amazon. It, it ships worldwide. <laughs> Isn't that cool? I think Amazon has done a fantastic job with the program and what they have been able to do. Um, okay, are you going to send the bonuses via email tomorrow? They are going to be in school. I recommend you to have a lookout on school, check in. And we do have a few additional things because while we went through a lot of topics today, and I hope that it got you already going and some ideas. The other portion tomorrow of having the workbooks and having some concrete ideas, niches, stationary products that coaches can use, um, I think is going to get you to the next piece. And there's going to be some interaction in the school. I'm going to be asking some questions. So I recommend you to be really all looking out for the school posts that I will be posting. There are going to be some prizes that you can win. I'm going to let you know what it is yet, but you will see tomorrow. And we're going to have a Q&A session as well and a mini training based on the questions. So you'll see um, um, tomorrow because in one and a half hours, there's always only so much that I can teach you. And what I've been brainstorming, like, okay, how can I bring across the most important part? And the most important is the overall strategy for success and the mistakes that you can avoid and then having an idea of what the transformational journey is. And the more tangible that is more logical and more, um, you know, actually doing the thing um, is then for tomorrow after you've already listened to me <laughs> uh, rant about <laughs> mistakes that can be done. And, no, but Dirk said, I, that's, that's really the essential piece. Um, okay, I'm confused how selling under your brand name protects your product from being copied versus selling under your real name. Um, no, these are two different things. With KDP, you usually don't use a brand name. You use um, a, a uh, author's name. 
So I have been doing KDP for a few years and I have also done topics that I didn't want people to be able to Google. If you have a KDP journal and if I use my personal name, if Google, someone Googles it, you can find it. I've ha I have some interest in manifestation and other like, you know, topics that I might not want everyone that Googles me to see that exactly. And on the other hand, that was my first thought why I never wanted to use my real name initially. Um, later on, as I was sharing on social media how it was working well, people wanted to learn from, from me how to do it. So then I also wanted to keep the books that I was doing a little bit more um, anonymous because I experienced when I shared it that there were people that were just copying it. It's usually just a small percentage of people, but then I was feeling a lot of conflict because I was sharing freely and then people were copying me. I'm like, oh, I, I wish to share a lot and help people, but I don't want to feel like that's going to have a bad impact on my sales uh, myself. So that's why for KDP, I've always done a more anonymous route. Um, however, with some of my um, members, like KDP members, they have seen some behind the scenes of some of the journals that I have openly created as examples. Um, but yeah, and then here for my physical product, physical product, I rarely sell it under your personal name. Like if you go and look at the five minute journal, you don't know who the owner is because no one really cares. Like, uh, and no one's going to care to see my name on this here either. Um, I'm not trying to build a personal brand. So my, my name ha does not have to be here. And I want it to be a brand name. And for physical products, that's usually the way to go, having a, a brand name, you know. And the reason why you can then not find my product by just looking for my name is because Amazon is not going to um, have that connection, right? Like they, they just know that the brand name, but they don't know mine. They do, but the listing doesn't know mine. Does that make sense? <laughs> I don't have that anyway. Um, so that's the difference because KDP always has an author name and it's very common to use pen names. Most people do. Many of my members, they don't use their real name. They just use pen names for their journals. And some that are coaches and not want to use the personal name because they want to create a personal brand, different stuff. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I look forward to seeing you in school. Have an eye out for the resources that come tomorrow. Uh, any questions? Yeah, um, keep them coming. We have 48 hours to watch the replays, to get all the resources and to join with the uh, package that we have as a special offer here. I look forward to seeing you and to be doing some work with you. <coughs> mm. Last question. I would be using a brand name for something that is not related to my business. Um, for a physical product, you will always you need a brand name. You never set under your personal name um, because you need a trademark. It's very usually people don't trademark their own name. Um, for KDP, you can always use your personal name if it's related to your business or not. Either way, what you can ask yourself: If people Google you, do you want them to find your KDP journal, or do you not want them to find it? If that's related to your coaching business, it makes absolute sense that they can find it. If it's not, if it's more like a personal hobby, then you maybe not want to do it. And you can use a, a pen name. And most people in KDP, in the KDP world, they do that. Physical product, we want to create a brand name. And a brand name can be a fantasy name. It just has to be checked if there is a possibility to trademark it. And we cover all of that also in the program um, and why you need a trademark. Like I always have a trademark for um, my product. Not for my KDP, I don't need it there for physical products, I do. So it's, it's a little bit different as an approach. Like I would consider this like a real business, 
And this one is a, a nice income stream, um, but I would not consider it a traditional business. It's like a side gig that can be a very lucrative side gig. <laughs> Let's say it's a side, yeah. <laughs> mm. What if we want to sell products that would lead to a coaching office? Well, then you want to use your personal name. That's why you need to consider what is the purpose. I don't have a coaching program for shadow work. So there was no need for me to have my own name out there um, related to this. Um, so I don't, even on my website, I don't necessarily show myself because um, it's not relevant to people buying this. If I had a, a coaching business, then it would be relevant because I want to create that connection with the buyer. I want them to see my face. I want them to see my name because I want them to later on be interested <laughs> in buying something that I have. Because then I, my intention is a different one. I want to create a personal brand while creating a product. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Thank you all. It was lovely to have you all here. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow in the group. I'll be answering more of your questions. Don't worry, your questions are not going to be missed. And um, we have some nice cool things happening. Thank you and talk to you soon. Bye.